Where's Janet? Safe. So far. If you've harmed her... You're not in London now, Dr. Garth, with your police. You're in Transylvania, in my castle. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know that there will be spoilers ahead. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on Dracula's Daughter, 1936. On IMDb.com, this movie has a way too low 6.3 rating. On RottenTomatoes.com, the film has a poor 64% on the tomato meter and a 43% audience score. I know I say this a lot. However, this movie is much better than the scores indicate. I have a review in the works, and I guarantee I will say that that movie is much worse than the score it has. On May 18, 1936, New York Times film critic Frank Nugent did give this movie a favorable review, saying, among other things, that Gloria Holden is a remarkably convincing Batwoman, and it is a cute little horror picture. This simple little tale picks up where Dracula 1931 and the Spanish version ended. This brings up a question that has bothered me for some time. Why did Van Helsing remain behind in the dungeon after he killed Dracula? The simplest explanation would be to set up the sequel. Were they thinking that far ahead? Did they know the impact that Dracula 1931 would have? If so, why wait five years? I think it may have to do with follow-up. In a minute, it will become clear that I have thought about this way too much. If I staked Dracula, I would cut off the head, burn the body, scatter the ashes, pour on holy water, encase him in cement, and cover with a silver mesh, just to be sure. I wouldn't want Dracula's bones to ride around in a traveling show with a stake where his heart was, a la House of Frankenstein 1944, so he could materialize and remember that I staked him. From your hand. I guess a healthy dose of paranoia can be helpful when killing vamps. I want to shout out to Elliot S. for his comments on the great actor Robert Ryan. Also to Rambling RJ for his excellent information on Cary Grant and David Niven. These comments are greatly appreciated and very important to the show. Keep them coming. Thanks. Actors. Edward Van Sloan reprised the role of Professor Van Helsing. In the original Dracula 1931, he was called simply Van Helsing. He must have spent the intervening years getting his doctorate. Wearing Coke bottle thick glasses, this older man eagerly fought the Lord of Darkness. No one else was as good except for maybe Hugh Jackman in Van Helsing 2004. I almost forgot Richard Benjamin from Love at First Bite 1979. Edward Van Sloan was first covered in The Mummy 1932, playing a similar character with knowledge of the occult. Hedda Hopper played a small role as Lady Esme Hammond. The gossip columnist was covered in Sunset Boulevard, 1950. Nan Gray played Lily, an important vampire victim. Gray was first covered in Tower of London, 1939. E.E. E. Clive was cast in the role of Scotland Yard Sergeant Wilkes. Clive was discussed in The Great Bride of Frankenstein, 1935. Gloria Holden played the role of Contessa Maria Zolinska, a.k.a. Dracula's daughter. Holden was born in England in 1903. She moved to America as a child. She eventually studied at New York's American Academy of Dramatic Art. Holden had a relatively good career in theater before transitioning to film in the early 1930s. Her first credited role was Wife vs. Secretary, 1936. Her film career continued until 1958 when she had a tiny uncredited role as a party guest in Auntie Mame, 1958. IMDb.com states that she was a Hollywood leading lady in B-movies and a supporting actress in big-budget film. She is recognized for several important roles. Her most remembered role was as Madame Zola in The Life of Emile Zola, 1937. Her exotic performance in Dracula, 1936, followed this. However, Holden was not happy to be assigned to this role. 
Her third memorable role was in Miracles for Sale 1939. Again, IMDb.com says she had a profound influence on later culture. It is believed that her performance in Dracula's Daughter 1936 directly affected the writing of vampire novelist Anne Rice and is mentioned in Rice's novel, The Queen of the Dam. Also, Harold Winston, who discovered the actor Bill Beadle, reported that he renamed the actor in honor of his ex-wife, for whom he still carried a torch. Thus, Bill Beadle became William Holden. Gloria Holden died in 1991. Otto Kruger played the role of psychiatrist and student of Dr. Van Helsing, Jeffrey Garth. Born in Ohio in 1885, Kruger attended Columbia University, where he began acting. Kruger made his Broadway debut at the age of 30 in 1915. His first film, The Runaway Wife, 1915, was the same year. He was occasionally cast as a hero in films like Corregidor, 1943. However, he was more often cast as amoral or a villain. His important roles include Dracula's Daughter, 1936, Saboteur, 1942, Murder My Sweet, 1944, and High Noon, 1952. A series of strokes led to his retirement in the mid-1960s. He died in 1974. Marguerite Churchill played the role of Janet, assistant to Dr. Garth. Churchill was born in Missouri in 1910. Some of her 28 roles are quite memorable and include The Valiant, 1929, The Big Trail, 1930, Dracula's Daughter, 1936, and The Walking Dead, 1936, with Boris Karloff. Her last movie was in 1950, and she died in 2000 in Oklahoma. Gilbert Emery played the role of Scotland Yard Commissioner Sir Basil Humphrey. Emery was born in Naples, New York in 1875. During World War I, he served with the Allied Expeditionary Force as a liaison to a French balloon company. He made 80 films between 1921 and 1945. Some of his more memorable films include A Farewell to Arms, 1932, Dracula's Daughter, 1936, The Life of Emile Zola, 1937, and That Hamilton Woman, 1941. He died in 1945 in Los Angeles. Irving Pitchell played the role of assistant to Dracula's daughter, Sandor. Pitchell was born in Pittsburgh in 1891. He graduated from Harvard University in 1914 and immediately started working in the theater. Pitchell founded the Berkeley Playhouse in 1923. He began studying at the Pasadena Playhouse when he moved to Los Angeles. Pitchell was active as an actor from 1921 to 1945. He began directing for 20th Century Fox in 1939. A lot of his movies were anti-German, pro-British films. Somehow, this led to trouble with the Un-American, House Un-American Activities Committee and blacklisting. While blacklisted, he moved to film noir. He also worked in sci-fi. Pitchell died in 1954. My new book has just come out. It's called Mystery of the Cave. It's book two in the Michael Potts Archaeological Mystery Series. It follows Michael and the crew up in Alabama as they get into a little adventure up there while they're working in a cave. It's about 200 pages long and fairly easy read. Think you might enjoy it? There's links below. Story. This movie picks up where the two 1931 Draculas end. Two Bobbies, a sergeant and a patrolman, enter the dungeon of Carfax Abbey. They find a body on the floor that has a broken neck. The body should be that of Renfield, played by Dwight Fry in Dracula 1931. In the earlier movie, Dracula killed Renfield on the stairway as Van Helsing, Edward Sloan, entered the Abbey. We also know that Mina, Helen Chandler, and John Harker, David Manners, left the Abbey, leaving Van Helsing and the dead vampire alone. Professor Van Helsing comes out of the room where the dead Dracula is laying. The two cops are looking at Renfield's body. Van Helsing tells him that the body of Renfield's killer is in the room he just exited. The sergeant has the other officer stay with Van Helsing while he searches. The sergeant finds the dead vampire staked in his coffin. We are given a very quick view of a low-quality wax figure with the approximate look of Bella Lugosi. The sergeant is shocked by what he sees. It doesn't help when Van Helsing says he killed the monster who had already been dead for 500 years. Do you know anything about this? Yes, I did it. Who is he in there? His name was Count Dracula. How long has he been dead? About 500 years. Five. They place Van Helsing in cuffs and haul him away to Scotland Yard. He is taken to Scotland Yard Commissioner Sir Basil Humphrey to explain the murders. Van Helsing explains vampires to the commissioner, and his story is rejected out of hand. 
Van Helsing wants to hire his psychiatrist friend, Jeffrey Garth, Otto Kruger, to defend him. The commissioner thinks Van Helsing will either be executed or committed to an institution for the criminally insane. You have admitted to killing a man in a very horrible manner by driving a stake through his heart. That is the only way a vampire can be destroyed. Van Helsing says he has done a service by killing the vampire. The commissioner's assistant enters and says the police want to know when Scotland Yard will be picking up the dead bodies in their jail. The commissioner says the bodies of Dracula and Renfield will be picked up that night. The sergeant and patrolman Albert, Billy Bevan, wait in the small town jail with the bodies. As it nears 9.30, the sergeant leaves to meet the Scotland Yard man arriving on the train. Officer Albert is not happy to be left alone. Albert hears the sound of scratching from the cells. He sees a rat tunneling underground. The sergeant doesn't believe it until he sees the ground moving. The sergeant gives Albert a small pistol before he leaves him alone. The exterior door opens and Albert is shocked to see a woman clad from head to toe in black. Her hair is covered as is the lower half of her face. Her dark eyes are very frightening. The woman asked Albert to see the body of Count Dracula. He refuses and she insists. She offers a bribe and he again refuses. Father, you wouldn't, Mom. The woman shows her ring to Albert and he is drawn into a trance. She tells Albert that he will remember nothing. Near 10.30, the sergeant returns with Sergeant Wilkes, E.E. E. Clive of Scotland Yard. Albert is still under the spell, remembering nothing. He sits at the desk, staring straight ahead. When the sergeant touches Albert, the cop falls from his chair. Wilkes goes to the back room and discovers that the body of Dracula is missing. The two sergeants go in the back and look into the empty coffin. About this time, they hear a wolf howl. The wolf sounds sick based on its coyote-ish cry. In the fog-shrouded woods, a woman who stole Dracula's body stands over it with her face unmasked. She has a look of great sadness. She says a spell over the burning body of Count Dracula, saying the body will be consumed in the purging fire. She also adds that the baleful spirits of the souls of man be purged as she throws salt into the fire. She subsequently requests that Dracula's body find eternal destruction through his unholy master. Finally, turning her face away, she picks up a handmade cross and asks the evil spirits to be cast out until the end of time. Her assistant slash hound of hell, Sandor, Irving Pitchell, leaves his lookout post and approaches the woman. She says she is free from the curse and can take her place with the living. Sandor has kind of a negative attitude and says perhaps she is free, but who knows what the next night will bring. Sandor's dress and manner reminds me of Rasputin. They leave for London before the sun rises. As the next night falls, the woman, Countess Maria Zaleska, a.k.a. Dracula's daughter, Gloria Holden, and Sandor are in a small flat in a poor part of town that she uses for painting. Maria again says that the spell is broken and she can live a normal life. Sandor keeps bringing her down, believing that nothing has changed. Maria sits at the piano and begins playing a lullaby. She talks of her memories, and each time, Sander interprets the memory as something evil. Maria forbids Sander to talk as the music turns evil. She realizes she is still a vampire. She asks Sander to look into her eyes, and when he does, he says he sees death. Sander helps Maria put on her cloak and go into the night searching for a victim. She doesn't know why the line is not broken. Sticking to traditional roles, she goes and bites a finely dressed gentleman. In Dracula 1931, men fed on females, and females only on males. The man looks into Maria's eyes, and his mind goes blank. She makes it back to the apartment just before daylight. Sander helps her off with her ring and cloak before she climbs into her coffin. Later, they show the bitten man dying in an operating room four hours after his last transfusion, just like Lucy in Dracula 1931. The doctor doesn't know what caused the two small puncture wounds in the man's jugular vein. In Scotland, Jeffrey Garth, Otto Kruger, is preparing for a hunt as a part of a long overdue vacation. As they prepare, the doctor's lovely assistant, Janet Blake, Marguerite Churchill, arrives in an open-top roadster laying on the horn. She speaks to them like they are in a relationship. She tells him that Van Helsing has been charged with murder and Garth must return to London to defend his friend. Garth meets with Van Helsing, and although he is a psychiatrist and not a lawyer, he agrees to represent his friend. Garth urges Van Helsing to stop spouting the vampire story. Garth was a student of Van Helsing in Vienna. Van Helsing makes a good case for the blurred line between reality and fantasy. 
That evening, Garth attends a formal dinner party hosted by Lady Esme Hammond, Hedda Hopper. Garth admires a painting of a faceless woman, a dark tree branch, and the full moon. Lady Hammond says the painting was done by a Hungarian woman who recently arrived in London. As Lady Hammond talks about how charming the painter is, Countess Maria Zaleska is announced at the door. Lady Hammond greets her guest as Garth gives Maria a looking over. Janet pops up in the background, showing the green-eyed monster. Maria and Garth are introduced. I never drink wine. Garth is drawn in by her eyes. Eventually, the talk turns to Garth returning from Scotland to defend Van Helsing. The people at the party are thrilled by the story of the murder. Garth thinks they won't be able to press the murder charge because Dracula's body is missing. Maria's eyes turn downward at the mention of Dracula's body. They begin to talk about vampires, and Maria wades in that many things are not understood. Garth continues that Van Helsing may have developed an unhealthy obsession with vampires. Betraying Van Helsing's confidence as a lawyer and psychiatrist, Garth also says he can be cured if the cause can be found for the obsession. This catches Maria's attention. She asks Garth if they can meet one evening to discuss his theories. I believe he thinks it's a date. Garth dresses for his meeting, while Janet snips at and mocks him for his interest in Maria. Garth travels to Maria's nice apartment. As he futzes with his tie, he says this is the first woman's house that he has been in that doesn't have 20 mirrors. Maria says she is glad that Van Helsink is not around because he would blame the lack of mirrors on the occult. She says a Hungarian legend says vampires do not cast a reflection in a mirror. Sander comes into the room and tells Garth he has a phone call. It is Janet making a prank call to interrupt his date. Garth rages at her and she hangs up. When Garth returns, Maria asks if the dead can influence the living. She says someone is reaching from the grave, filling her with horrible impulses. Garth doesn't believe in the supernatural. He tells her that her mind can control the obsession and it is a matter of being willing. Garth says that he will help Maria. He tells her that like whiskey before an alcoholic, she must face a test to beat her problem. Garth tells her to set up a test to see if she can resist her obsession. Sandor comes in and tells Garth he has another call. Maria tells Sandor that Garth can help her. Garth rages on the phone thinking it's Janet, but it's Dr. Beamish, Fred Walton from St. Mary's Hospital. He wants Garth to see a patient named Lady Anne. Maria sets up an appointment to meet Garth the next night. Garth leaves for the hospital. After Garth is gone, Maria tells Sandor that they are going to the studio to paint, so he must go out and find a model for her. Sander lurks in the fog, dressed as a mafia don. He sees a young woman looking at the water that may be getting ready to jump. He tells her that the river is cold, but he knows a place with warmth, food, and money. She rejects his kind of money, but Sander tells her it's a modeling job for a female painter. Oh, that's okay. Just go with a strange man now. When she arrives, Maria is kind, and the girl is introduced as Lily, Nan Gray. Maria asks strange questions such as, Do you know where you are? Did you come willingly? And have you seen me before? Sander brings food and wine. Lily enjoys the food and drink as Maria continues. She says she is studying young girls' heads and shoulders. Maria then asks her to take her blouse off. The naive Lily does as she was asked. I'm doing a study of a young girl's head and shoulders. You won't object to removing your blouse, will you? No, I guess not. Maria watches as Lily removes her shirt. Then Lily volunteers to lower the straps of her slip. It is all very sexy. Maria can't resist her vampire tendencies. Lily gets scared and wants to leave. Maria uses her ring to place Lily in a trance and moves in as the young female protests. With a scream from Lily, the scene is cut away as Maria feeds on her, breaking the opposite sex rule. Sometime later, Lily is brought to the hospital. Garth comes into his office in the hospital and rages at Janet for the prank phone call. She resigns. Garth is immediately called to Lily's room. The nurse tells him it is a rather unusual amnesia case. Garth tears up Janet's resignation letter. He orders her back to work and to follow him to the examination. Lily is staring straight ahead and suffering from blood loss and amnesia. The other doctors say they have given Lily two blood transfusions. Garth says Lily is in a post-hypnotic trance. When Lily was picked up while wandering around, she said something about blood and a woman before going silent. The other doctors show Garth the two puncture wounds on Lily's neck. Garth orders that she be given adrenaline to force her out of the trance. Because of the puncture wounds, Garth goes to see Van Helsing, who is with Scotland Yard Commissioner Sir Basil Humphrey. After reading the report, 
Van Helsing clearly states that the injury to Lily are the work of a vampire. Sir Humphreys believes that since Dracula's body is missing, he may be responsible for the attack on Lily. Van Helsing says no vampire could survive the staking. I guess Van Helsing never saw House of Frankenstein 1944. Sir Humphreys gets disgusted with himself for starting to talk about vampires as if they were real. Van Helsing says that Dracula created many vampires during his reign. Garth reminds Sir Humphreys about the dead gentleman found earlier. He thinks they may be just working on a defense for Van Helsing. Garth says he thinks Lily will wake from the trance after dark. Van Helsing says that the vampire will have a box of earth and no mirrors around. Garth starts to get the idea. Later, Janet comes in dressed for the evening. Janet makes a case for keeping her job by tying Garth's bow tie. She leaves in a huff. She meets Maria, who is coming in for her appointment. Janet lies and says Garth is out. Maria then hears Garth's voice and asks Janet why she lied. No answer is given. Garth is surprised to see Maria. She is trembling and begging for help. It came over me again, that overpowering command. Wordless, insistent. And I had to obey. What was it? I, I can't tell you. It's too... too ghastly. Maria says she will be leaving London that night. She says she gave herself a test, as Garth recommended, and failed horribly. Garth unveils a machine he says will help Maria. The machine is a mechanical hypnotizer. When Maria learns that the machine has lights reflected by mirrors, she refuses to proceed. Maria says there is no more time for experiments. She asks Garth to leave England and come away with her. She continues that he must save her soul. However, Garth begins to suspect Van Helsing is right and Maria is a vampire. He calls her out for not telling him the truth. Garth gets the call that Lily is ready. He tells Maria to wait and be ready to tell him the entire truth when he returns. After that, he says they can form a plan. Maria says to herself that she will be leaving London tonight and Garth will be coming with her. Sandor is outside the hospital with the car. It seems Maria's mind summons him to come to her. Before Maria leaves, Janet returns. Maria is keeping a civil tone, but Janet is being harsh. Janet says Garth is only interested in Maria as a patient. Sander enters the room wearing a bellhop outfit. Janet is frightened by Sander's sudden entrance. Maria orders him to load Janet in the car after taking her out the back way. Lily is awake in her room. Garth, a nurse, and two other doctors are present. They dim the lights and crank up Garth's mechanical hypnotizer. Lily is freaking out a bit. Garth talks as the machine places Lily in a responsive mode. She resists as Garth urges her to remember. Lily begins to talk about Maria's ring, her eyes, and not wanting to pose. Lily gives the location of Maria's studio in Chelsea. Then she drops dead. Garth heads out of the room to find Maria. He finds the window open and hears the car pull away. He then travels to Chelsea, where he does find the art studio above a bookstore. The bookstore owner tells Garth that a woman matching Maria's description is on the third floor, and strange things are happening there. Garth uses the phone to call Sir Humphrey. Sir Humphrey is in bed working on his stamp collection when he gets the call. Garth gives the address and tells Humphrey to get Van Helsing and come to the studio immediately. Garth doesn't wait and enters the studio alone. The apartment has been packed and is empty. Maria comes out of the back and announces that she is leaving for Transylvania that night and Garth will be going with her. Garth tells her that she is going to Scotland Yard for the murder of Lily. He then reminds Maria about the other man she killed. Maria admits for the first time that she is Dracula's daughter. Maria then tells that she has Janet as a prisoner. Garth makes a phone call and finds that Janet has left a message saying she will meet him in Chelsea. Maria flees out the back door just before Sir Humphrey and Van Helsing arrive. Van Helsing is shocked that Dracula has a daughter. It shouldn't be that much of a surprise, he had three wives in Transylvania that he left. Sir Humphrey is not buying the story. Finally, Sir Humphrey decides to put a dragnet around London. Van Helsing says that Maria will be found in Transylvania. Bobbies, wire flashes, files, pictures, and radio broadcasts are shown. In the morning, Sir Humphrey and Van Helsing are waiting at an underling reports that they searched Maria's apartment and found nothing. She has escaped from the city. Sir Humphrey gets a call that an unidentified plane with no lights left over before sunup. Sir Humphreys calls Paris. Van Helsing admires the planning of his new opponent. Another underling informs Sir Humphrey 
that Garth had chartered a plane and is flying to Transylvania after Maria and Janet. Sir Humphrey and Van Helsing decide to follow. Garth's plane is shown at night, making its way to the continent. In Transylvania, there's what appears to be a happy German village. They have an Oompa band play. They speak German. The happy villagers are drinking from steins and dancing in the streets. A young couple is getting married. The howl of a sickly wolf from the direction of the castle puts a damper on the party. Inside the castle, Maria begins to arise from her coffin. They cut away and she is standing. A light is turned on in the castle and the villagers start having a cow, maybe a whole herd. As they look in horror, many say Dracula has returned. The villagers make a dash for the safety of their homes. During the confusion, Garth arrives in a horse-drawn carriage. The driver is told that Dracula has returned and he doesn't want to go any further. For the cheap sum of five pounds, Garth convinces the driver to take him to Borgo Pass. The rest of the village plan on barring their doors for the night. At the castle, they have Janet in a trance. Maria explains her plan to Sandor, which includes giving Garth eternal life. Sandor wants to know about the promise to make him a vampire. Does anyone have an example of a familiar being turned into a vampire? Leave it in the comments if you do. I heard about one familiar who was made into a vampire, and now he has a big castle and he is really successful. My master says I'm going to be a vampire in a few days. It's only been seven decades. So have any of you met a familiar who's become a vampire? Not personally. Never met. Well, I'll be a vampire soon, and then you'll know a vampire, and it's then close. you can it's become close. my thing. Sandor is very unhappy and says he will kill Garth if he comes to the castle. Maria is wrapped up in her planning and ignores Sandor. Maria and Sandor look at the trance Janice. Sandor says it will not be long until Maria feeds on Janet. She agrees and sends him away. The coach makes it to Borgo Pass, and Garth is dropped off by the driver, who quickly flees. Garth walks to the castle and Sandor shoots a rather large arrow at him from the battlement. Garth has a pistol and continues into the castle. Maria is losing control and about to feed on the helpless Janet. Garth begins to walk up the famous Dracula stairs when he sees a shadow near the top. Garth sees Sandor running and fires at him. Maria stops short of Janet's neck when she hears the shot. Garth enters another basement that looks oddly like Carfax Abbey. Maria enters from a doorway under the stairs. Garth and Maria come face to face. Garth asks about Janet and is told she is safe. He begins to threaten Maria, saying that if she has harmed Janet, but he is cut off when she replies that he is not in London with his police, he's in Transylvania, in her castle. Where's Janet? Safe. So far. If you've harmed her... You're not in London now, Dr. Garth, with your police. You're in Transylvania, in my castle. Sir Humphreys? Van Helsink and two local policemen arrive in the town. They knock on the inn door and the keeper opens it. What is the point of barring the door for the night if you're going to open it when somebody knocks? I think I know how these local vampires are finding victims. Knock, knock. Land shark. Maria lets Garth go see Janet. He checks her over and sees that she has been placed in a trance. Garth thinks he can revive her, but Maria tells him her spell is older and Janet will die like Lily if he interferes. Hypnosis, huh? Something older and more powerful. Maria says only she can break the spell on Janet if Garth agrees to stay and be her vampire buddy. To save Janet, Garth agrees to become a vampire. Maria uses her ring and begins moving towards Garth. Sandor uses his bow and arrow to shoot Maria with another oversized arrow. As Maria is hit, Janet begins to move. Humphrey and Van Helsink arrive in front of the castle as Maria staggers to the battlement before falling. Sandor aims another arrow at Garth, but he is shot dead by the police. Van oh! Helsing and Humphrey go outside to find Maria. Janet wakes, smiles, and hugs Garth. Van Helsing shows Maria's dead body to Sir Basil Humphrey. Oh! He explains that she was killed by a wooden arrow passing through her heart like a stake. Sir Humphrey says she is beautiful, which is an odd thing to say about a murdered vampire. Van Helsing says she was when she died 100 years before. There's your vampire, Sir Basil. The arrow. The woman is beautiful. She was beautiful when she died. A hundred years ago. Don't forget to subscribe to the show where you're listening. 
and I'm also on social media, so check me out there. Conclusion. Universal Studios' original plan was to make a Dracula sequel based on the Bram Stoker short story, Dracula's Guest. During the negotiation with Bram's widow, Florence, it was discovered that the novel Dracula had accidentally entered the public domain. Since Florence Stoker wanted some creative control and Bela Lugosi wanted a lot more money to reprise his iconic role, the studio took the opportunity to write a new story for the movie. The movie had a large budget for the time of $278,000. The movie was made in the Universal Studios lot in Universal City, California. It was filmed from February 4th, 1936 to March 10th, 1936. Less than a week after the production wrap, Standard Capital Corporation, a prime studio creditor, seized the studio and threw the Limmels, including founder Carl Limmel, out of the business. I don't usually give trigger warnings, but I will in this case. From here on, I will be discussing queer coding in vampire films and literature. So if you don't want to hear this, stop now. An NBCNews.com article by Elaine Patton from October 30th, 2021, states that Dracula's Daughter 1936 is, quote, the first, most famous, and perhaps only example of an early Hollywood lesbian vampire film, unquote. Maria's primary motivation is to free herself from the influence of her father, which is something most individuals experience at some point. This could be viewed as a part of the lesbian vampire ethos. Maria's first kill revealed in London was a male. However, when she tested her desire, as recommended by Dr. Garth, Maria had Sandor bring a female victim. Maria cannot resist the temptation and feeds on the young female Lily. She then continues her quest for liberation by kidnapping another female, Janet. She wants to free Janet and turn Garth into a vampire. However, she is strongly tempted by Janet. Maria's oppressive familiar fills every scene, breaking Maria's spirit by telling her what she cannot accomplish. In a fit of jealousy, Sandor kills Maria with an arrow. Returning to the article, it is made clear that Maria is not being portrayed as a creature in search of romance, but is instead cast as a predatory lesbian. This makes her something to fear and a danger to the ordered society. Evelyn Dar states, quote, One of the reasons people might like the lesbian vampire trope is it has a built-in good girl, bad girl trope. You see it in a lot of les flicks as well, unquote. It also, quote, plays with a sense of danger that a lot of us like, unquote. According to the article's author, Dracula's Daughter 1936 helped lead to the sexually exploitive female vampire films of the 1960s and 70s following the demise of the Hayes Code. World famous short summary, couple has some nips before they commit. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave a review where you get your podcasts, media, or YouTube. It really helps the show get found. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at ClassicMovieRev.com. Beware the moors. All right, there'll be two squares and a circle pop up. The top square, that's a movie selected just for you. The bottom square is a playlist related to today's film. And the circle will subscribe you and you'll find out every time new content comes out.